What's up my stat stars, Michael Princhak here and welcome to a video over the top 10 things that you need to know coming out of AP Statistics Unit 3 over collecting data. I'm not talking about all the topics in the unit, I'm just talking about the top 10 that I think are the most important in helping you prepare not just for your Unit 3 test that you have in class, but also for the AP exam in May. So all of these things are things that I think come up a lot on the AP exam and things that you really need to know if you're going to ace any information coming out of Unit 3. So let's dive right into them. Number one, know the goal of collecting data. The ultimate goal is that we want to know a parameter from a population, a parameter, something that's true or something that sum summarizes something in that population. And unless we can do a census and get that parameter exactly, which is gonna be very hard and very time consuming to do, we often just get a sample. And from a sample, we collect a statistic. Again, anything that summarizes a sample. And the ultimate goal is for that sample statistic to be very, very close to that population parameter. But it's never gonna be perfectly close because of natural variation that we have called sampling variability. Now the idea is this, we want to reduce that variation between our sample statistic and the population parameter as much as we can. So making sure that we don't have bias and that we have good random representative samples is all super important to make sure that we can get as close as we can to that population parameter. For example, if we want to know the true proportion P of people in a population that have brown hair, we can go and get a sample of people taken from that population and we can find our P hat. That is the sample proportion of people that have brown hair. Now the sample proportion is not going to match the true, not going to match the true population proportion perfectly, but as long as we're free of bias, random and representative, we should be really close. So everything we do is trying to reduce that variation to get our sample statistic as close to that population parameter as possible. Tip number two, when it comes to collecting data, we could do something like a sample survey if we're just collecting some basic data, or we could do an observational study, or we could do an experimental study. Now, oftentimes you're gonna be asked, what is the difference between an observational study and an experimental study? Well, I look at it as two really important differences. First, what actually happens in those studies. In an observational study, you're just observing. You're allowed to ask questions. You're allowed to talk to your subjects and gather information from them, but you're not allowed to give them any treatments or do anything that could affect your response variable. Whereas in an experiment, you are imposing treatments onto your subjects to determine how those treatments affect some response variables. So that's the first difference. The second difference is what you could actually conclude. If you're just doing an observational study, the only thing that you can conclude when you're all done is that there might be an association or a relationship between your variables. You might find out that sleeping a lot is related to getting good grades or getting good sleep is associated with getting good grades, but what you cannot say is that getting sleep causes you to get good grades. If you want to use that word cause, and even with an experiment, it's still hard to use that word cause, but if you even want to attempt to use the word cause or have a cause and effect relationship, you have to conduct a very well-designed experiment. Tip number three, know the different sampling techniques. You have a simple random sample, a stratified random sample, and a cluster random sample, and the last one is called a systematic random sample. Knowing those four different techniques is really important because there's usually gonna be one to two multiple choice questions where you have to read a sampling technique and determine which one it is. A simple random sample starts with your population, everybody gets a number, ignore repeats, ignore numbers nobody has, and you randomly pick 50 of them out. But the idea is that any group of 50 could be picked that's what makes a simple random, simple random. Now, in a stratified, you first break your population into groups. Maybe you divide your population up by ethnicity, for example, and then you take some people at random from each different ethnicity. All right, great groups, you take some from each. Now, those groups are called homogeneous because everybody in each group has something in common. They're all homogeneous. And then you take people from, again, can't say it enough, from each group. In a stratified random sample, you are really guaranteeing yourself representation of an important variable like ethnicity that you think matters. Cluster is when you separate your population into, well, many populations. So maybe your population is already somehow divided into these little groups, and each of these little groups itself is like a mini population, meaning that they're heterogeneous within the group. Each group is a nice mix representing that population. Then you don't label your subjects, you don't take some people from each group, what you do is you label your clusters, and you randomly select one or two or three, however many you want. You randomly select your clusters to be your entire sample. All right, 
The key there is whatever cluster gets picked is already like a mini population, so it will be representative. Systematic samples, when you say, oh, I'm going to take every fifth person or every sixth person or every tenth person, you're going to see that if. Now listen, all of those are great. All of them are random, but some definitely have positives and some have negatives in some situations, while others have different positives and different negatives in other situations. So it all depends upon the situation in terms of which one you want to use that's best, but being able to simply recognize by reading a scenario which type of sampling technique is used is super important. The fourth tip is you have to know how to select a simple random sample. Whether you're selecting a simple random sample from a population, or you're doing a stratified where you're selecting a simple random sample from each group, or you're doing a cluster sample where you have to do a simple random sample of the clusters, or maybe you're doing an experiment where you have to randomly decide who goes into group A and who goes into group B, you got to know the basic process to performing a simple random sample. It's actually really easy. Every subject in your population gets a number, unique number, use a random number table or a random number generator, ignore repeats, ignore numbers that nobody has, and the first 50 numbers that get selected and the corresponding people to those 50 numbers become your sample. If you're doing an experiment, maybe the first 50 people that are randomly selected will get treatment A, and the next 50 people will get treatment B. But the most important thing is you follow those four basic steps I just outlined. Step one, everybody gets a unique number. Step two, ignore repeats and ignore numbers that nobody has. Step three, use a random number table or a random number generator. Don't pick them yourself. And then step four is finding the corresponding people to those numbers that can go into your groups or become part of your sample. Tip number five coming at you. In this tip, what I want to focus on is stratification. What is the purpose of stratifying? A lot of kids misunderstand this. This oftentimes is a really important AP test question. Here's the deal. When you stratify based on a variable that matters to you, you're stratifying because you want to get equal representation, or not necessarily equal, but a representation from each of your strata or each of your groups. All right, that's all fine and dandy. You could be asked what variable you think is best to stratify on, and that comes down to what you're measuring. You only want to stratify based on a variable that you think matters to what it is you're measuring at the end. If a variable doesn't matter to what you're measuring, don't stratify on it. Now, why is stratification so important? Go back to the first tip. We want to get our sample statistic as close to the population parameter as possible. And populations are very diverse. Populations are very mixed up. So that means we want our sample to be very diverse. We want our sample to be very mixed up. Having a bunch of differences in your sample is actually a really, really good thing because then it's going to mirror the population. So if you stratify and take some people from each of, say, an ethnicity, then that's guaranteeing you that representation that you need, that's guaranteeing your group is very mixed up, and when that happens, you're actually going to get closer to the population parameter that you're trying to find. So it's all about reducing variation to the variable that we're measuring at the end. We want to get as close to that population parameter as possible, and with a nice mixed up sample that a stratification could help us guarantee, we're going to make sure we get there. Tip number six, understand bias. Bias could cause a sample statistic to be extremely far away from the population parameter that you're trying to estimate. In general, we have two umbrellas for bias. We have selection bias, which means that anything is done improper in how you select your sample. It could be simply doing something that's not random, using volunteers, doing something out of convenience, undercovering an entire group or overcovering an entire group could lead to selection bias. Basically, your selection process is messed up and it wasn't good enough to produce a random representative sample. The second umbrella is what we call survey bias. Survey bias is when something is wrong with your survey. So maybe you have the most perfect, random, representative sample in the world, but how you ask the questions or the survey you give them itself has bias in it. This could be the wording of your questions that could cause somebody to give a different response. We actually have a name for that. That's called response bias. Anytime the response from a person is not truthful or a lie, there's some type of response bias there. Could be the person asking the question causing the lie. Could be the wording of the question causing the lie. It could be a broken scale. Maybe you got a bunch of drafts and you want to get their weights and the scale that they're on is broken, so all the responses are lies. But that's response bias. Non-response bias is when a group of people that were selected to be in your sample choose not to respond. Now, some people say, ah, who cares, just ask more people. That's never the solution. Here's why. Maybe the people who don't respond 
are not responding for a particular reason that makes them different than those that do respond. And remember what we've said twice already in this video, we want our sample to be mixed up, diverse, representative, and different. And if there's a difference between people that respond and people that refuse to respond, I want those differences in my sample. So I need to get those people to respond. Maybe I call them, email them, bug them, go to their house, give them some type of incentive. As long as that incentive gets them to respond truthfully, I'm fine with it. But we got to get them to respond so that we get their opinions. Tip number seven, know the four pillars, four principles, four elements of good experimental design. First, we have treatments. Well, you need two or more treatments for comparison reasons. If everybody in the experiment gets the same thing, you have nothing to compare it to to know if it even got better. So you gotta have comparison through two or more treatments. Second, you gotta have randomization. Which subjects get what treatment has got to be done randomly. And we don't do just randomization for fun. We do so because randomization helps control for other extraneous or confounding variables that we cannot control for. I look at randomization like a salt shaker. It takes your people and it mixes them up and it evenly disperses them into your groups. That way, both groups are very different within because your population is very different within and then your groups are all different within which makes them similar between. So that way, the only differences between what your subjects have is what you choose to give them. All right, the next pillar is replication. Now, replication actually has two layers to it. The first layer is do your entire experiment again and hope to get similar results. If you can get similar results by doing your experiment one, two, three, four, five times, it only gives more credibility that your results are accurate. The other type of replication we have is replication within an experiment, which means the more subjects, the better. If you have a thousand people getting treatment A and a thousand getting people getting treatment B, well, with a thousand people, you have good replication because with a thousand people, you're going to get a lot of nice diversity and a lot of good representation versus only five people and five people. With only five people in one group and five people in another group, that's only five people. You're not going to get that diversity and that replication that you want. So the more people, the merrier, the more, the better. It's going to give you stronger, more valid results. Results. That's also a form of replication. The fourth and final pillar is direct control. There are always going to be extraneous or lurking or confounding variables that you can control for. Like if you're giving people a pill, they all take the same pill at the same time. The pill is all the same color, so everybody's blinded. They don't know what pill they're taking. Everybody's getting something, so they have the placebo effect controlled for. The idea is that you need to make sure that you have control. If your experiment deals with plants, they all get the same amount of water. They all have the same amount of soil. They all get the same amount of sunlight. All of those things that you can control for needs to be handled, and randomization takes control of the things that you cannot control for. Hopefully that makes sense. But every good experiment needs to have those four things. There are other things like using a placebo, single blind, and double blind. They're all important, but they all can't always be used depending on the situation. But the four pillars have to be there. All right, for tip number eight, let's talk a little bit more about randomness. Why is randomness so important in selecting a sample and in determining what subjects go into which treatments for an experiment? Well, I've actually already mentioned it a few times, but I think it's super, super important. Randomness is what creates mix. And we like mix, we like diversity, we like representation because that's what our population often looks like. So when we pick something at random, what we're doing is we're getting a nice mix. Is it gonna always be a perfectly even mix? No, but that's okay because that, that's the population. It's not perfect either, right? But the idea of why we like randomization is it creates randomness. It creates diversity. It creates representation. It's like that salt shaker. It's just mixing it up and giving you everything that you need. Same thing with an experiment. We really want those two groups to be very, 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 very similar between, which means that they're both very, very mixed up within. And randomness should help that occur. That's why we love randomization. So make sure that you understand how to do something at random, giving everybody a number, using your number, random number table and all that fun stuff. But also, also gotta make sure that you understand why we need randomness, because it creates representation, diversity, differences, and that's what we want if we're gonna get closer to the population parameter that we're trying to find. Tip number nine, know the three different experimental designs. First, we got completely randomized design. Second, we have a randomized block design. And third, we have a matched pair design. So let me give you a quick example to run through these. Maybe we wanna do some type of experiment to learn whether listening to classical music or country music is better at helping kids 
uh, study or prepare for an exam. All right, so completely randomized design. We got 100 kids, everybody gets a number. 50 of them are gonna go into the uh, country music group. 50 of them are gonna go into the classical music group at complete random, right? That's salt shaker, randomly dispersing all those other variables we can't control for. Block design is when you're like, boy, oh boy, there's just one variable that's way too important for me to just leave up to randomness. Maybe that variable is gender. You know boys and girls are going to perform differently at the end of um, a unit, and they're also going to respond differently to music. All right, so we block. We put all of our girls in one block. We put all of our boys in one block. In the boy group, randomly, half are going to get the classical music, half are going to get the country music. Same thing with the girl group, half country, half classical. So at the end of the day, we still got half our people listening to country music and half listening to classical music, but now now we've guaranteed that representation of gender. Finally, we have matched pair design. Matched pair design can only be used if you have two treatment groups or two different treatments. And the idea is that you pair two people together because they are very, very similar. Two boys, both have high IQs, both get good amount of sleep, right? You, you think about all these variables that could impact your response variable and you pair them together. Then, randomly, one gets treatment A, the other gets treatment B. That way, you have really solid results, and if one kid gets better because of the classical music, you can't blame it on anything else because it was so similar to the kid that he was compared to. Batch pair design can also be done with people get paired with themselves. You just gotta be super careful. It can only be used in certain situations, but you could definitely pair people up with themselves as well. And the final 10th tip is this. Know who you could infer or generalize your results to. Whether it's a sample or an experiment, you gotta be able to understand who my results could go to. Now, if your sample was selected at random, whatever you learned from that sample can be generalized, inferred to the larger population, but only the larger population in which that sample came from. Easy. Now with experiments, we kinda have a double layer of randomness here. First, if we want to say that there is a cause and effect relationship, our explanatory variable, cause response variable, who gets what treatment has to be done randomly. Gotta be done randomly. But if we want to take the results of that experiment and apply them to the general population, then the people in the experiment had to be first randomly selected from the population. So if you have that double layer of randomness, randomly select the subjects from the population, then randomly assign them to the groups, you could A, say that there's a cause and effect relationship, and B, you could say that that cause and effect relationship can be generalized to the larger population. Now listen, in an experiment, oftentimes you can't randomly pick people because then you gotta make them do something, so you typically have to use volunteers. Not the end of the world. As long as those volunteers are randomly assigned to their treatment groups, you could still say cause and effect, but the problem is you could only infer or only generalize your results to people similar to the volunteers in your study. You can't necessarily infer those results to all people. All right, that's it for the top 10 tips coming out of AP Statistics Unit 3. Hopefully this will help you do really, really well on your Unit 3 test in class and prepare really, really well for the AP exam test in May. But if you are looking for more practice review response questions, practice multiple choice questions, study guides, and way more detailed videos, please check out the ultimate review packet for AP Statistics. You get a free trial to check it out and see all the great benefits it has to help prepare you. Best of luck.